there's about four kind of main ways that we're applying AI to the work. One is that it's helping us look for trends in lots of ad tests in ways that are much more efficient. You've tested thousands of ads, just like it's difficult to search through thousands of comments to find a theme. It's really hard to find themes in thousands and thousands of ads. There's a lot of work to watch them all and figure out you know, which ones have certain tones or feature certain kinds of people. You know, It's like actually quite hard. So if the machine can do that for you, you can suddenly answer a lot of questions that marketers want answers to that otherwise is just really impractical to get an answer to. Right? We get questions all the time. Can you benchmark tests of ads that look like this, with this format, with this length, with these kinds of characters, with these kinds of tones, compared to other people in our category or different categories, right? So every time somebody wants something, they're basically asking you to go watch 10,000 ads and like check whether or not they have some criterion or not. So being able to just ask, you know, in this case, um, you know, Google's uh, you know multimodal model to watch the ad for us, check that it actually does a pretty good job when we ask these questions. Like, is an enormously more efficient way to answer those questions. So that's quite important for the industry and for our work. The last one, which is actually probably the hottest topic right now, but I don't know if you ask me next year if it'll still be the hottest topic, we'll see, um, is what, what people are calling in the marketing industry synthetic sample, which is basically the idea that instead of asking consumers for their feedback, you ask a chat GPT like LLM, right? Now, what's weird about that is of course like you're trying to sell to a consumer so consumers got to make the product purchase decision ultimately so you kind of care more about what the consumers think than about what an ai thinks but weirdly the llms are predictive in certain circumstances of what humans will think and not only are they predictive of what humans will think weirdly they're predictive of how that will change when you show them certain treatments as in ads or messages that's kind of mind blowing, and anyone that pretends to understand that isn't, I think, telling you the truth. Um, there's a whole bunch of active research into why this works or doesn't. The paper here, who's, which is by one of our um, former team members, Luke Hewitt, um, who was here at MIT, um, was went pretty viral on this topic. So if you look up that reference, you'll see a whole bunch of coverage of this preprint, which will probably be in Science, I think, later in the year, um, which is, you know, obviously the, the sort of top journal you shoot for when you're doing science, hence the name. Um, what he did was he took like 100 different published social science experiments and swapped out the humans for LLMs and got them to answer the questions. And he found that you could predict the answer, but interestingly, only with the more sophisticated models. So the predictiveness went up enormously as you went to the current generation of LLMs. So this is like highly suggested that there's some very sophisticated internal representation, perhaps something that looks a bit like this that it's figured out how to my beliefs as an LLM that is maybe pretending to be a certain kind of person get updated as I'm given new information in the form of whatever the treatments were in each of these experiments. The key watchouts here, which most people trying to sort of, you know, oversell this usually lead out, um, is firstly that all of this stuff is um, social science experiments of different kinds. So, you know, it's in social policy, political science, psychology, you know, so it's. It's not what muffins do you like. Um, and it remains an open question how predictive, and we're doing this work right now with Luke, in fact, um, where will muffin ads fit on this range of predictiveness? Answer is nobody knows, we don't know yet. We're certainly gonna find out. We're using the same approach to do this. Um, but you know, there's reasons to suspect it might be more difficult because a lot of this stuff is kind of on topics like reducing prejudice or you know more pro-social attitudes, things that maybe are a little bit more kind of over time persistent as a way of thinking and less what's hot in the market right now in the supermarket and what am I, am I hungry or not? Um, so watch this space, you know, will predictive, um, will synthetic sample replace um, humans? I don't know, certainly people that don't want to spend as much money on doing experiments would like it to, but um, it's not clear if it will. The other thing people are trying to do to avoid um, doing a lot of experiments is once they've done a whole bunch, and there's several large firms that sell a version of this kind of idea right now. And let's grant them that they've done an excellent measurement and all those numbers are actually right. They're not like some silly proxy that is like where your eye looked. They're actually the list, right? Turns out that's contestable assumption, but let's assume they got that right. Then what they do is they say, okay, let's train a model, which you can do because any great machine learning person, just like if you've got a bunch of numbers, you can say, I'm gonna train a model and the model is now going to um, predict, in other words, for every ad that gets a number, it's going to find some patterns that it identifies, and we're not going to know what those patterns are. That's sort of this, I guess it's supervised learning, but it's still you don't understand what it's done to discern the pattern. And then we're basically going to be able to give it new ads and see what number comes out 
the end of the same model, right? It's sort of, a lot of people hear that and they're like, well, that makes sense. The model learns what ads are good and somehow now it'll tell us what other ads are good, even if they're not ads that it's seen before, right? Well, it's a very dangerous idea because like, you've got to have some basis to know whether those predictions are right. You know, when you go back to the original kind of classic machine learning problem, when they first figured out you could use these approaches to recognize handwriting, for example, this is a this is a problem set maybe people here have taken a CS class have probably done in many cases, right? Um, you know, you train it on thousands of handwritten number eights and number fours, and uh, you say that's a number eight and that's a number four, so it's sort of labeled data, supervised, I guess. I guess. Um, then the model is actually very good, right, at that. But here's the thing, right? It's not very good if you give it something out of distribution. The distribution of all of its training data was the numbers 0 through 9 written in handwriting, right? There were not letters A through Z in there, for example. So now you give it an A, and it's going to confidently say number 9, right? Or some other silly answer, right? Because it's out of its distribution. So if you're going to make a claim like, I can predict what ads are going to work, you have to establish that the model is trained on a relevant sort of domain of distribution that you can then extrapolate from. Otherwise, you're just writing the number A in a box and handing it to a number model, right? So for example, consumer sentiment has like dramatically shifted just in the last week as we've like faced the increasing likelihood of a major recession and a dramatic, you know, as of today, 100% increase in, you know, goods of any price of any goods imported from China. You know, so the idea that an ad about this stuff, we work with uh, health insurance companies and there was obviously a well-publicized event that happened in the health insurance industry like towards the end of last year. I can say from very good knowledge that that made a big difference to consumer sentiment about health insurance products. So you have a bunch of research in your model from you know, like pre that period and you look at stuff post that period, you know, you've got very good reason to know that in fact it won't be predictive. So what's predictive, what's not? Well, people don't know, so they have to be careful with these kinds of approaches and they, they feel like shortcuts. Thank you very much.